This is Australia Overnight with John Deeks. Uh, every week you hear Jim Sherlock. He's a film historian, he's a reviewer, he's a critic, he's a very, very well-versed man when it comes to all things film and DVD and other forms of electronic media. Uh, but I have him in the studio this morning talking about something very different to that. It's about a very important subject, and that is Jim Sherlock. Uh, and I'd like to say good morning to you, Jim. Good morning, John. Jim, we first time we met, which was a few weeks ago, uh, you said to me that you, you, some of your early life, which I thought was absolutely fascinating, um, you had a, a very tumultuous start to your life, and I thought it was intriguing, and I felt that our view, uh, and I felt our listeners could uh, benefit uh, from an extraordinary tale, which you very kindly agreed to relate. Tell me about your early I, life. I didn't think it was tumultuous at the time because I was too young. I was nine years old. Uh, we migrated from Scotland and arrived here in 1960. Mm. Uh, not long after we arrived here, um, my mother and father were going through a few problems, as a lot of families do. Uh, unfortunately, I was like, I think, a bit of the spare tyre and I was having a lot of problems with mum and dad at the time. And I would run away from home. Um, subsequently, they broke up. And as a result of that, because of me being the age that I was in 1964, um, I, be I was, became a ward of the state and I was taken from home um, and put in a boys' home, which was in Melbourne, and it was called Tally Ho Boys' Home. And um, I would never complain about my home life again after being put in that institution. They were absolutely brutal, you know, and they, when they belted you, they belted you with closed fists. I've got mm. a smashed eardrum um, and I've got partial damage. Uh, my, I had to have an MRI once because uh, in the mid-80s I had a stroke and uh, so I had an MRI and the, the doctor said, uh, have you ever been beaten as a young boy? And I said, well, yes, I was. And he said, well, it's, 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 well I've got it on the x-rays. Wow. Said, it shows. But anyway, <clears throat> I went to Tally Ho and disliked it immediately. I can understand um, that. And uh, getting used to this regime which was run by British, it was pure British, we, you know, it was God save the Queen in the morning. It was God save the Queen at night. It was everyone who staffed the place were British. I, I didn't even know I was in Australia, uh, literally. It was it was like a little compound um, of the United Kingdom. And they brought the rules, the arcade rules uh, that would have been left over. The people I were dealing with or the people that were supposed to look after me came from World War Two, And that was strict. And, and but you were nine years of age. I was nine years, 1964. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I thought, right, okay, up the pegs went and up the tent went and I was off. I got beaten one day uh, for um, uh, literally just an example. And um, that night I, I got dressed and, and I ran away. And I got the last train or one of the last trains into the city of Melbourne and it was pouring with rain and I was wandering through Melbourne uh, very upset of course uh, not knowing what to do not knowing where my next meal was coming from I didn't go home to my mother and father or to either one of them and um, I was standing in a laneway uh, next to this big building and there was an air vent in the bottom of a door and it had been broken slightly open so I forced it open and climbed in. And this is I, in the city of Melbourne. This is in the city of Melbourne. And I forced it open. How symbolic is this, which I didn't realise from decades later, that uh, I climbed in and I climbed in and I went up a few stairs. There's lots of rubbish. I was behind the screen at Melbourne's Regent Theatre. My goodness. And I, there was a lot of rubbish and a lot of junk. And I um, then made myself a bed. Uh, I just wanted to go to sleep. I don't even know what movie was playing. So, uh, so the, it was about what time of night? That would have been probably about oh, quarter to eleven, eleven, eleven thirty around was that time. Was it operating at the time? It or? was, yeah. So oh, there was oh, a yeah. film. There was a film showing. Showing. Yeah. Do I, you recall what the film was? No, I don't know what the movie was. I can't remember. Um, but I was so worried about at first trying to. I, I had no idea where I was, um, and uh, I was worried about getting caught well then of course the session closed and the cleaners did their job and and the area where i was backstage was absolutely huge so over the next few nights i would search around the theater i to eat i ate candy bar food i would go out into the foyer look around to make sure there was no one around the whole place was sealed shut mm. uh, i went out there and i would 
take candy bar food as something to eat and I would drink uh, some orange juice or whatever was in the cans or whatever. And I soon, I, I soon learned how to hide. Behind the Regent Theatre was a, 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 a just a, a, a just corridors, uh, uh, catacombs mm. um, of change rooms, all, old dressing rooms, which all went down into the, the Plaza Theatre, which was the home of Cinerama. Mm. And so I knew plenty of places to hide if someone suspected that I was there. And on one of the nights, about the third night that I was there, I was laying curled up in what was a curtain. It was a green part of part of a green velvet curtain, and I felt something crawl down the back of my neck, and it was a stray cat. It was a young kitten. Jim Sherlock, uh, film historian, with us now. Jim, at the age of nine years of age, has run away from a boy's home has found himself in the middle of Melbourne at nine years of age, gone through a... Uh, broken into the Regent Theatre in Melbourne and has made that his home. We're going to continue with your story in a moment, Jim. But before we do, I want you to choose a song from that era that you remember and you loved. One from that era I loved fondly. Um, it had a huge impact on me for a number of reasons, and that is the song Goldfinger by Shirley Bassey. This is Australia Overnight. We're back now with Jim Sherlock, film historian, talking about his early life. And Jim is always in here every week to talk about uh, the latest movies, releases, and etc. But he has a, such a fascinating early life, and Jim has kindly agreed to relate some of that time to us. Uh, if you've just joined us, Jim was in a boy's home at nine years of age. He ran away from that boy's home after some horrendous... Uh, treatment and, uh, and, and and shocking abuse, found himself in Melbourne on a very cold and rainy night, broke into the Regent Theatre in Melbourne and has virtually become a stray within the theatre and his, is living unbeknownst to the owners and the, uh, the, the night watchman and everyone else and living off the candy bars from the candy stand. And we left the story, Jim, where you were lying down and you felt something crawling on you at the middle of the night and it was a cat. It was a small cat, it was a small kitten, it was just looking for... So I didn't know what it was until I, I froze, I, I, st I can still feel it now. Yeah. I absolutely froze until I heard it meow and I realised it, it was a little cat and we became the closest of friends. I only knew uh, my life uh, was only a world of fear um, at that time. I wasn't worried about what people were thinking about me having run away and, and where I may be. I just wanted to survive. And over a period of a number of months, which went into years of looking after that cat, I always went back and looked after the cat. I was behind the Regent's screen for all up for seven years. So from, from nine years of age to 16, you lived in the th Regent Theatre did anybody know you were there? No, nobody knew I was there. For, not, for that long? Seven, seven years. Seven years? I knew all the traps. Um, there was there were stairways behind walls, which I, I would stumble across, and I would go up, and it would take me up into the ceiling of the region. And I used to, with a cat and I, used to sit on top of the big dome um, and look down into the auditorium. And the region theatre sat 3,500 people. And that's how we used to sit up there and watch. I, I, there was many places to hide, many places to have great fun with. And uh, I was caught um, and taken back to Tally Ho. I never revealed where I was. The brutality continued. Uh, and I, I won't go into detail what happened. Um, but I ran away again. Um, I went straight back to the Regent Theatre, and this happened time and time and time again, and no one ever knew I was up to. As a matter of fact, from 1964 to 1971 was such a harrowing period uh, in my life. I learnt my major schooling didn't come from school. It came from movie tone news, cine sound news. It came from the movies that I was watching time and time again. Countless films, everything from the Bond films, uh, the Sergio Leone spaghetti westerns to It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, the Cinerama movies downstairs. They all were my education. Um, and I, I knew not too long after the, when I realised what, Tight, what capsule I was in was probably going to be for the rest of my life. But on one occasion when I was caught and taken back to Tally Ho, and I really do want to mention this story, a little quick story, was I, I couldn't swim. And Tally Ho had this monstrous swimming pool. And they, there was a young boy, his name was Greg, and 
they said, would you like, we want you to learn to swim and we want you to go for your swimming certificates two or three in one night. So they opened the pool for me. They wanted to give me something to stop me from running away. So I did. I thought, okay, I can learn to swim. And I did over a period of probably, I think, seven or eight months, uh, I did with this young boy. He said, I'll do it with him and I will teach him. He was from another cottage because Tally Ho was broken into mm. cottages uh, where boys lived. He was with me every single night, every night through that whole period. And on a Friday night to go for my swimming certificates, he was brought in with me. He said, I want to swim with Jim when he does his certificates. And he did. And there was the cottage parents there. There was the superintendent of Tally Ho. His name was Mr. Godby here, was there. They're all standing at the edge of the pool. And bit by bit, I went through all the motions of having to swim for, I think it was two certificates. I got them. I was proud as punch. I got them. Greg, the next morning, he had delayed his weekend leave. He was older than me uh, by a few years, uh, four years or five years. And he delayed his weekend leave to help me on that night after doing what he did through the whole process uh, of nearly a year um, and so he delayed it he stayed with me stuck with me he got he was the only one that gave me a hug the next morning he went on weekend leave and he was walking down a road in Frankston and he was killed and it's one of those things that still sort of haunts me to this day had he not stayed that Friday night he would probably still be alive today and that just shattered me they called me Monday morning in school they called me and they said, um, they told me what happened. I was too young to realise the seriousness of death, but that would play on me and grow on me as I got older. I, a week doesn't go past where I don't think about him. And I ran away again. I just couldn't take it. And I went back to the Regent Theatre. It was the only place that I felt secure. It was the only place where I felt any warmth and the cat was the only living creature that showed me any affection at that stage. Now, I didn't realise how serious all this was mm. until, until you know, I got older. And um, in an extraordinary feat of events when the cat died, a lot of other things happened. We haven't got enough time to go into it. But when the cat passed away, I found her little body. And uh, I travelled the, 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 the late, late at night on the, on the trains with the old Red Rattlers. Do you remember those? I certainly do. And the train stopped at Elstonwick Railway Station mm -hmm. and I had this big paper bag and the cat's body was in it. And uh, this guy got on and said, well, this, it, the train stops here now, it's finished. Well, you live here? And, of course, I said yes because I didn't want him to call the police. Yeah. And um, I went off and I buried Bush and I still pass by where she's buried every day. Um, ba, 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 ba. In your own time, buried every day. Uh, I've kept this a secret. I kept this a secret for over thirty-five years. My partner, who the listeners, um, uh, wonderful listeners on this station, um, have never they have heard her name many times because she's with me now. Uh, I kept this a secret for thirty-three years. Never told anybody about it. I wanted to forget it. I was married for eight years. I never told my ex-wife um, this story. I never told my mother and father this story. I just wanted, it was so dark and horrendous and there was so much emotion involved, I wanted to just put it behind me. The other reason was, ironically, only about 10 days after the cat passed away, I was living in the Regent Theatre, it was closed at that time, so they closed it, and I was living there, I was showering there, and backstage, uh, I had nowhere to live. And uh, I was walking down um, a street in Melbourne where the dispatch for a, a, now a huge company called Roadshow was, mm -hmm. and they knew me because I used to go in and collect little movie posters and stuff, you know. And the boss came out and he said, hello little Jimmy, how are you? He said, how old are you? And I told him, I lied a little bit about my age, and I said, you know, he said, oh, okay. He said, can you come here next Monday? I've got a job for you. And that's how I started in the industry. Uh, it, it was all just locked into place, just extraordinarily locked into place. Then I forgot about it, and um, many, many years later, two and a half decades later, I was in the office of David Mariner, uh, the big theatre uh, person, of course, and uh, he said, Jim, he said, can you open... Um, one of my theatres, uh, one of my theatres as a cinema for the first time since 1970. 
And I didn't think anything. Well, I thought, oh, well, yeah, okay, which one? And he said the region. And we took nine months, myself and Jason Mariner, to get it up and running. And on the press day, I was backstage and I had water in my eyes. And David Mariner walked up and said, are you all right? Because I was about to go out and face the press, uh, a whole sea of press. And he, I said, yeah, I'm fine. I used to sleep just there. He said, sleep where? I said, right here. I used to sleep here. And I gave him a time capsule of what this extraordinary period was in my life. And he bolted out on the stage. And he said, Jim Sherlock's coming out in a minute and he's got a story to tell you. <laughs> and so it's, it was interesting that the whole thing went full circle but I was the one responsible for reopening her as a cinema, and I was the last one out the door. Um, but as I said, one of the reasons I couldn't talk about it was because the people that I ended up working for when I became a publicist and when I became a critic and all that kind of, they were the bosses in the Regent Theatre at the time when I was living behind the screen. They would have fired me. Mm. So I had to just bury this behind me. I, I owe a great debt of gratitude in being able to talk about it. I, would, I, I have a, a, a mild manuscript of all this. People you keep couldn't up. write a script like this. It's just extraordinary. People, of a man who knows <clears throat> movies back to front and upside down and sideways, you know what a great movie this would make. Oh, I don't know. No, I don't. Oh, well, it, do, it would. It was a I'm very looking at your partner. Oh, it? Uh, yes, I'm getting a nod. I, I, I kept it from my partner for 10 years. Uh, you know, ten, it wasn't until the years after we met that she actually found out that she thought I just went to school and, you know, all this kind well, of stuff. Well, we are, we are totally indebted to you for passing on that. I, I want to wrap this up. Okay. After you give me a song at oh. 17, what song would you mm -hmm. like to hear, Jim? Uh, the Windmills of Your Mind by Noel Harrison. It's been such an honour to have Jim Sherlock come in and share the story he related to me and is only recently related to publicly, even to his uh, beloved partner. Um, it's been an extraordinary tale, Jim. Um, you started with Roadshow? I was a dispatch boy with Roadshow for a short time, then I went to Hoyts. Hoyts. And I became an usher. Uh -huh. And then I was only at Hoyts a matter of a few months and I became a junior publicist. Well, you've, I know you were a publicist for a, the big... And you've had so many friends who have uh, have been huge stars in the industry. And uh, it, it still staggers my imagination to this day. That you know, I remember talking to an actor by the name of Charlton Heston, and I went quiet. And he said, I knew him for twenty years. And he said to me, uh, "Are you there? What's wrong?" And I said, "Mr. Heston, I said I grew up, you know, behind a cinema screen, staring at you, you know, in awe." And I'm now talking to you, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yes, I, at the end of the day, no matter what I do in a profession, whether it's a, a magazine or a newspaper, radio, television, I'm still a movie buff and I still get a little bit Star Trek, Star Trek sometimes. I think you have to. Yeah. I certainly do. And I certainly am with your incredible tale. Jim, thank you so much for sharing it with our listeners. Thanks, John. Jim Sherlock. I hope you enjoyed that uh, repeat of the Jim Sherlock interview. I thought it was very much uh, a worthwhile repeat because we'd had such a reaction to it going to wear the first time and I thought it was certainly uh, something worth hearing again. Amazing story, an amazing man and we certainly thank him for his uh, uh, honesty in relating that incredible story of his youth. Jim Sherlock, the story. Hopefully he will write a book. And um, I tell you, it could really be a, a great movie as well. OK, we're coming up to the 1 o'clock news. My name is John Deeks, and I'm here with you till 5.30.